evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Museum of Science in Boston. My name is Tim Miller. And I'm here tonight to talk to you about nanotechnology. Now, this is a word that's been very much uh, in the news and the popular media over the last couple of years. If you haven't heard of it yet, you soon will. And what I'd like to try to do tonight uh, is sort of demystify a little bit uh, exactly what uh, this field of science and technology is. Now, we'll start with the word itself. I'm presuming that you know what technology is. You might not know where nano comes from. And nano is actually just one of many uh, prefixes that we use uh, in the scientific notation system. Uh, there are a whole host of them, and shown here are their multiplication or division values uh, on the right-hand side. And nano is just the one down here, 10 to the minus ninth. So a nano something is 10 to the minus ninth of that thing, a billionth uh, of that unit. We get the word nanotechnology from the distance, the nanometer, a distance of one one billionth of a meter. That's a very tiny size scale, about eight atoms lined up end to end, or the width of one strand of DNA. Uh, but you can have a nano anything. You can have a nanosecond, or a nano year, a nanogram, a nanoliter. Uh, any unit, any metric unit, uh, can be multiplied by any one of these multipliers. Uh, nano also, as I'm sure you've noticed, has been appearing more and more in popular culture and in the popular media. Uh, the names of products called nano or marketing materials that are using that phrase or that word uh, are multiplying. And that's also actually not that new. Uh, those of you who are old enough to remember marketing materials from the 70s and 80s will recall that there was a time when lots of different products were referred to as mega or micro, right? We still refer to uh, processors in computers as the microprocessor or the microchip. Um, and that's, again, a use of this same system. But there is something different and special about the science that we're able to do on the nanometer scale, sometimes called the nanoscale. And the interesting things that we can do there were first articulated by one of America's most famous physicists, a man by the name of Richard Feynman. Now, Feynman was not only a great academic, but also a great educator. And he was widely praised for his ability to speak to the public and to undergraduates about issues in science and technology. And at the very end of the 1950s, he gave what is now a very famous speech to the American Physical Society called There is Plenty of Room at the Bottom. And in that speech, Feynman argued that there were a whole host of fascinating discoveries to be made at the very, very small size scale. Now, at the time, most physicists believed that the most interesting questions in science had already been solved. We'd split the atom and uh, developed the, the transistor for the first time. And most people thought that technology was uh, sort of plateauing. Well, Feynman disagreed. And he argued that by making things very small, that by doing science at a very, very small scale, we could revolutionize a number of things. And in fact, he articulated four specific areas where we might make a big difference. And they were information, imaging, materials, and machinery. Now, at first, Feynman suggested that by miniaturizing the devices we currently make, we could revolutionize the way we make and store information. And it's important to remember that at the time he gave this speech, uh, computing state-of-the-art consisted of machines like this, the Harvard Mark I, that occupied entire rooms and that were less complex than the uh, processors most of us currently have in our wristwatches, and that data was stored almost exclusively in libraries. We printed paper books, we bound them together, we put them on shelves uh, in libraries. And Feynman suggested uh, that we could radically improve our methods of storing information if we could make uh, tiny imprints or impressions on thin metal or plastic disks, which in fact is exactly what we do today. A modern compact disk or a DVD is a thin sheet of polyethylene, which is a type of plastic, that has a series of these grooves cut in a circular pattern around the disk. Some of the grooves are short, those represent a binary zero. Some of them are long, those represent a one. And these are already actually nanoscale features, or close to it. Uh, the length of a groove in a DVD is something like 400 nanometers, 0.4 microns. Uh, and the density of information that you can store on those disks has gotten phenomenally high. The latest generation is called Blu-ray. Uh, and a single Blu-ray disc can store something like the equivalent of the amount of information you would have on an entire floor uh, of one library, which is a phenomenal change. And miniaturization also, obviously, has changed the way we process information, due largely to what I would argue is the most important invention of the 20th century, the field effect transistor. Uh, 
Now, the transistor is the basis of computer processing technology and also of computer memory. And it works in a simple way. It controls a flow of electricity from the source to the drain by the application of an electrical voltage to this thing called the gate. It's a switch, basically. But they can be made very, very small. And the reason that computer technology in particular has been progressing so quickly over the last 30 to 40 years, I mean, most of us buy computers for maybe $1,000 or more. We keep them for three to four to five years, and then we throw them out and buy another one uh, because the next generation is so much better than the last. Uh, that's a, a very fast technological change. But it's been enabled almost exclusively by the shrinking of this device. The distance between the source and the drain is getting smaller and smaller with each successive generation of computer processors. The current generation now has that distance at something like 40 to 50 nanometers. We call it the 45 nanometer process. That's the name of the fabrication technology. Uh, and that device has been getting smaller and smaller uh, and enabling computers to be faster and faster and more complex. Now, interestingly enough, this revolution in information that Feynman proposed has largely been achieved. And one of the interesting fields of nanotechnology now is how do we get away from this type of technology? It turns out that as the source and the drain get closer and closer together, you lose the ability to turn the switch on and off with a voltage at the gate. There's a certain distance here, and we're not exactly sure what the distance is, but it's probably on the order of 10 to 15 nanometers at which electrons can simply jump or tunnel from the source to the drain. You can no longer turn the transistor on and off. And because this is a multi-billion dollar industry, obviously there's a lot of interest in finding uh, the next technology or architecture that's going to replace this idea. The second thing Feynman suggested is that we needed a revolution in our ability to image things. Now at the time, the electron microscope was a relatively new idea, and Feynman argued that we needed to make that microscope much, much better. Well, we've not only done that, but we have in the last 20 years created a whole new class of microscopes called the scanning probe microscopes. Now these are microscopes that instead of firing either photons or electrons at a material and looking for their reflection, operate by moving a tip, rostering, over a surface back and forth and sensing the electrical changes, uh, the forces that change as that tip moves back and forth, uh, and then drawing a map of the surface. And those microscopes have enabled us to image things on a very, very small scale with greater resolution than we've ever been able to do before. In fact, they've also allowed us to manipulate things on that scale. Because you're using a physical tip, those microscopes are able not only to take pictures of things on a small scale, but to move them around. This here is a picture of a thing called a quantum corral. These were first built by a man by the name of Don Eigler at IBM. And what he's done here, each of the little spikes that you see represents a single atom. Now he's doing this at a very low temperature, but he's using the tip of his microscope, bringing it down to the surface, and then dragging an atom at a time around the surface. And he was able to arrange them into this ring. The waves that you see in the center are the waves of the electrons interfering uh, with one another. And that's a radical change. These types of microscopes have really enabled us to manipulate things uh, on the fundamental level, one atom at a time. In fact, Feynman actually said in his speech, someday the day may come uh, when we actually can move individual atoms one at a time. We are now at that level. Now, this is not particularly useful for making a device that you might use uh, because it's slow uh, and not a sort of industrial scale process, but we are beginning uh, our ability to move and image things uh, yeah, on a much more sophisticated level than we've ever had before. Feynman also suggested that really understanding and manipulating things on a small scale might enable some real revolutions in the field of materials. And this, I think, is really the sort of forefront of where most research in nanotechnology is today. It's the re-engineering of materials to do new and different things. Uh, and that takes two sort of different forms. Sometimes it's actually building new materials, uh, designing or discovering molecules that have geometries that we haven't seen before. A good example of that is this thing called the carbon nanotube. This is a, a long, thin tube of carbon atoms uh, that can have some really amazing properties. They can be super strong or extremely uh, conductive. They can be semiconductors. They're extremely flexible. They're good conductors of heat. And they come in many different forms that uh, share some of these many different properties. It's actually a naturally occurring form of carbon, uh, but we've discovered it recently and can manipulate it and make some new 
molecules out of it. This is a picture of a mat of those tubes all grown together. But sometimes it's also just taking materials that we already know about and making very small pieces of them and finding that they behave in a different way. This photograph is of a material that we call quantum dots. Now these are very tiny little pieces of a semiconductor material that are grown in solution. So we uh, take a solution of semiconductor and uh, add another material and the uh, pieces sort of start to grow. They self-assemble up into these little chunks of semiconductor. Now what's interesting about this photograph is that every one of those vials contains the exact same material. The only difference between this one and this one is the size of those chunks of semiconductor. And that, if you think about it for a minute, uh, is really contrary to our experience, right? You wouldn't expect a jar of big marbles to behave fundamentally differently than a jar of small marbles. And yet, that's essentially what's going on here. These are the smallest particles, and these are the largest. It's the same semiconductor material, but just by changing the particle size, uh, we're able to change the way that it reacts, in this case, to ultraviolet light. So uh, that's really the forefront of materials. Sometimes it's designing new materials, and sometimes it's just designing new structures that make old materials behave in a new and different way. And this is really uh, at the forefront of the applications of nanotechnology, and it has applications in some of the most important uh, issues in science and technology that are facing society, like energy production. Lots and lots of people in material science and in nanotechnology are trying to create uh, less expensive and more durable photovoltaics for solar cells. We could, if we had the technology, generate all of the power that we need on this planet directly from the sun with no waste and zero emission. But again, the, making the panels that we have today is a cost prohibitive process. How do we have better materials to make more panels? That's a pressing question. Uh, the other great resource question in the world, obviously, is access to water. A huge swaths of the developing world, and in some places the developed world, uh, don't have enough access to fresh water. And that problem is expected to worsen as the climate changes. Now there's plenty of water on this planet. The surface of the Earth is three quarters covered with water. Uh, but of course we can't drink it because of the salt content a number of people trying to use new types of materials to create filters or um, other materials that will remove salt from water. The picture you see in the upper right hand corner uh, is of a thing we call a quantum point contact. These are people firing electrons through a, a tiny sort of gate to understand how electrons behave in the hopes of making the next generation of computing technology that we think will use what we call the spin of an electron instead of its charge. Uh, and this is a, uh, a picture of a prototype for what we call a lab on a chip. A number of people in a number of places trying to make biological sensors or detectors that can do the kinds of measurements on uh, biological samples that currently take an entire room in something the size of the palm of your hand. Currently, if you have a blood sample or a urine sample and you want to test it for 15 different things, you need to cycle it through 15 different machines. A number of people doing very smart things trying to make it so that you can do the same number of tests with just a few drops of that same material. And that's the sort of, uh, as I said, real forefront of where nanotechnology is today, where the most interesting questions are being tackled. But it's not the only thing uh, that Feynman originally mentioned, and it's also not the final frontier of where nanotechnology might go. Because Feynman also suggested that we might make a revolution in what he called miniature machinery. And this is where some of the more far-fetched uh, and hard-to-believe suggestions about nanotechnology uh, have come from. And the fear of some of those things, which may or may not be possible, uh, is one of the things that's motivated these types of uh, public outreach and education efforts. And this is a type of science fiction image that you can find if you surf around the internet uh, looking for information about nanotechnology. We have here some presumably glass or plastic robot uh, grabbing on to a red blood cell uh, to inject it with some fluid of unknown origin or purpose. And there's a number of reasons why this is either impossible or a completely useless thing to do. Uh, the first is, based on whatever that object is designed to be made of, you simply couldn't make something uh, uh, that fine a scale. If it were glass or plastic, it would be impossible to manufacture it with that kind of precision, uh, and it probably wouldn't be rigid the way you'd want it to. The second is that 
I can't think of any substance that you would want to inject into a red blood cell. Red blood cells don't have DNA. Uh, all they do is carry oxygen. I can't imagine what you would be treating it for. The third is that I can't imagine how many cells this device can treat itself before it runs out of that fluid. So you'd have to add enough of these devices comparable to the number of red blood cells you have. I don't think anyone would want a gallon of those things injected into their bloodstream. This probably wouldn't work. But that doesn't mean that there aren't things on this size scale that we could do that would be interesting in, for example, biology. This is an artist's conception of a tiny machine that actually exists. This is a T4 bacteriophage, and it's in fact smaller uh, than the device I just showed you. It's a virus, and it's a virus in particular that eats the E. coli bacteria. It lands on E. coli, injects a strand of its DNA, creates more uh, viruses until eventually the bacteria ruptures and the virus run around and find more E. coli to eat and kill. Now that's a pretty interesting and complex system. We didn't build it, it evolved on its own, so it's not technically a machine, but there's a lot that we can learn about how that system works, uh, and the day may come when we can, in fact, redesign systems that work at that size scale and with that level of sophistication. And it's important to remember that biology knows how to do all kinds of really interesting tricks that we know nothing about or that we absolutely cannot recreate. A pine cone contains a number of seeds that have on them all of the information, all of the engineering diagrams to build a giant sequoia tree. And the raw material to make that tree comes out of thin air. The tree is pulling carbon dioxide directly out of the atmosphere, using the sun's energy to bond those carbon atoms into big molecules uh, to create the material that's in the tree. All the information is contained in the seed, and all you need to do is put it into the soil, and it somehow knows to draw the nutrients and the raw materials that it needs to create that gigantic system. This is not a, a designed system. Uh, it's, it's an evolved system. But it does these incredibly complex things. And we are beginning to understand more and more about the machinery that runs these kinds of systems. And that may enable us to recreate systems that work with something like this level of complexity. Because it's important to remember that the encoding for those systems, and indeed for systems like us, is largely an information processing question. You can think of DNA as a code, not at all dissimilar from computer code. And one of the things that's interesting about nanotechnology is that for the first time, people from fields as disparate as genetic engineering and computer science are talking to one another and seeing if they can't share ideas and methods. It really is a science in its infancy. So I would argue that there's a place here where the three traditional branches of science sort of all coalesce and come together. That place is the place where we're doing nanotechnology. It really is a convergence of these three sciences. People working in labs that are doing nanotechnology are bringing very disparate scientific professionals together to work on the same problem. It's not uncommon to find a biochemist and an electrical engineer working together to achieve uh, a specific goal. I want to thank you very much for your time uh, and for your attention and for coming here this evening. Thank you. <laughs>